Hello and welcome everyone to the second in a series of virtual events on Afghanistan, part of our new initiative Onward for Afghan Women. Today's focus is Afghanistan's education crisis under the Taliban, ensuring access for women and girls. I'm Alain Brevere and I'm the director of the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace and Security. When the Taliban were last in power almost two decades ago, one of the first things they did was ban women and girls from school. And when they were ousted from ruling Afghanistan in 2001, one of the primary goals for the country was to ensure that women and girls would again have the right to go to school. And they did in significant numbers. Over the last 20 years, girls made up almost 40% of students in the country. The numbers of women in higher education also grew significantly. But now with the return of the Taliban to power, women and girls face a harsh new reality. Most of Afghanistan schools are closed for the winter break, except for those in the South. The Taliban has claimed that when the schools reopen everywhere in March, they will be open for women and girls. But there are questions about the veracity of this claim. In some parts of the country where schools are open, girls have for the most part not been able to attend. There have been wrenching stories that we can read just about every day from women and girls not able to return to the classroom their human rights violated, their aspiration extinguished. If schools are allowed to reopen for women and girls, what will the nature of the schooling be under the Taliban's extreme Islamic code? What will the curriculum be like? The Taliban object to male teachers for girls and to mixed classes of boys and girls. How will the shortage of female teachers be addressed? What kind of education will be practiced? Since the Taliban have returned to power, tens of thousands of Afghan teachers have not been paid. How will this crisis be addressed? To answer these and many other questions and to provide solutions and recommendations, we will hear from some of the foremost Afghan experts in the field of education now living in exile. Our new initiative, Onward for Afghan Women, aims to elevate and equip Afghan women leaders wherever they are now living with opportunities to continue their advocacy on behalf of all Afghan women and girls. You can follow our work at onwardafghanwomen.org. We are joined today by some 500 participants on Zoom and more are tuned in on Facebook. We have already received many pre-submitted questions, but you are also able to submit questions throughout the discussion by using the chat function on your screen. And now to begin our discussion, my colleague, Palwasha Hassan, a new senior fellow at our Institute at Georgetown, is joining us with the opening remarks. She is the director of the Afghan Women's Educational Center, a major NGO in support of Afghan women's access to education and to other services, a tireless advocate for women's meaningful participation in politics and peace building, including in, in peace negotiations and the con constitutional lawyer Jirga and Afghanistan's reconstruction forums. Paul Washa was deeply involved in all of these engagements. So Paul Washa, we turn it over to you now and your great expertise on this issue. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, and a very good morning to all the uh, panelists and audience that who are joining us today for the event. Um, as you uh, mentioned very well, amongst the several Taliban restrictions imposed on women, that including uh, banning them from work, jobs outside homes, mobility without a um, mahram is still uh, another issue. Um, uh, is 
is education is still a haunting issue um, uh, for women in Afghanistan, uh, uh, ba banning of secondary school and higher education. Although uh, as a concession to international community, the Taliban agreed to reopen universities for girls to attend uh, with segregated spaces uh, recently, uh, at least in six provinces, um, they, uh, they started that. Uh, however, secondary schools are yet to start um, in all the even warm places because we have two uh, uh, school years in Afghanistan uh, in warm and cold places is different. Uh, so, um, uh, and there is a very eager uh, uh, waiting for uh, this, um, uh, if there is anything um, close to reality that uh, these schools will reopen to girls. Um, the issue is that that six years of Taliban previous rule, um, uh, we know that for six continuous years, uh, girls were deprived from education. Um, and then uh, the continued breaching of uh, promises that Taliban uh, has made uh, on uh, issues like general amnesty, um, and then uh, uh, curtailing of uh, freedom of expression, uh, continuation of uh, extrajudicial uh, killing and disappearance of activists. Uh, these are the issues which leave little trust or no trust um, of women and general Afghan public on the promises which are made that this spring the school will restart for girls. Uh, of course, we have all other issues like what will be curriculum, um, what will be the condition and all those things, uh, which is part of the overall coding and restriction that the Taliban has uh, introduced in Afghanistan. Uh, this is happening where, uh, uh, despite of uh, a huge and remarkable improvement, like 9 million children in the last uh, 20 years were able, with the support of international community and um, uh, democratic regime in Afghanistan, uh, they were able to join uh, schools. Um, uh, still, we had like 3.5 million children out of school in that time, uh, where majority were girls, almost 60%. So now this newer issue is adding up to the already existing um, uh, lagging behind um, uh, situation that we have on the part of education for girls in Afghanistan. Uh, just to move on the positive side, in, in um, that last four decades uh, in Afghanistan of conflict, uh, women having been just sitting there, and uh, there have been a lot of experiences, including under Taliban regime, and those who can recall uh, the underground schools, and uh, that shows how much resilience is there on the ground, and women are always looking for something new to make sure that uh, uh, girls in Afghanistan have the same chance as they had once for their education. And I think in today's panel, we have several of these women who has, uh, have different and innovative ways of continue, continuing their struggle. Um, uh, we have Maria Rahim today with us, for instance, where uh, she has been Dean of um, uh, University and um, beside her uh, uh, position on the teaching, it's also important that she supported the leadership courses for young girls to uh, be brought up as uh, educationists and um, uh, leaders in different sphere. Uh, we have um, uh, Dima with us with all the whole background of uh, AWIC for 31 years on girls and women education. And uh, uh, we have Shabana with a very innovative way of um, uh, schooling for girls. Um, uh, which she continue with uh, um, on that role for, for a long time. And hopefully we can uh, be joined by our um, uh, other participant who is yet uh, here, but this whole innovation of long distance learning and online uh, learning 
exist. Uh, and I think these are some of the experiences that we need to build on. And uh, it will be important for um, uh, our uh, panelists to share this with audience uh, and uh, raise the uh, awareness on the possibilities of continuing a struggle of Afghan women and we don't stop on where we left on August 15. I think there is a very high potential among the uh, diaspora plus who has recently left and we have to make that connection back to Afghanistan and girls education in particular because that is the key to change and I think it's a huge uh, reception in the communities as well for girls education. And we shouldn't lose that synergy because just a small number of men, uh, armed men who are taking the power in the country to hijack everything uh, for the people, and especially women and girls in Afghanistan. So with that, I would stop and like to hear from everybody else. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Paul Washa. And you had uh, walked through the uh, background of some of our uh, panelists who are going to begin speaking to us now. Uh, and we will begin uh, our conversation with Shabana uh, Basich Rasik, a leading voice for Afghan women and girls education and the co-founder and president of the School of Leadership Afghanistan, better known as SOLA. It is the first and only Afghan led private boarding school for girls. Shabana knows the value of an education. Born and raised in Taliban controlled Kabul, she dressed as a boy and attended school in secret since education for girls was forbidden. After graduating from university, she committed herself to creating educational opportunities for girls. And now with the return of the Taliban, Shabana has evacuated her students and staff and they are temporarily relocated in Rwanda where their education is continuing. Shabana has received global recognition for her work, including the Malala Medal in 2018. Shabana, we turn to you now. Thank you for your leadership on these issues. I know many of us uh, are always happy to read your editorial comments uh, in various newspapers. So thank you for keeping this issue of Afghan education for women and girls uh, on, uh, on top of everybody's radar screens. Shabana. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Verveer, and uh, good morning um, to everyone. Um, it's an honor to, to uh, join you all for this uh, really important discussion um, on the uh, crisis of uh, uh, you know, education in Afghanistan and particularly um, the uh, added challenges and obstacles facing um, girls in Afghanistan and uh, what are some of the opportunities to address those. Um, um, I will, for those who don't have a background on SOLA, I will briefly uh, mention that SOLA um, uh, as the first and only private uh, boarding school for girls in Afghanistan, we have nearly 100 students uh, representing uh, 28 of the 34 provinces and uh, in a incredibly um, uh, difficult time when Afghanistan is the only country on earth where girls access to a secondary education is outlawed. Um, SOLA as um, an all girls uh, middle and high school is uh, continuing to educate um, Afghan girls and um, we're uh, extremely proud uh, of that as an institution and hope that um, the situation changes for, for the rest of uh, girls in Afghanistan uh, who, whose desire to continue with their education is ever vibrant. Um, uh, to, uh, you, men you asked a very important question in your remarks, Ambassador Revere, that um, if schools were to open under the Taliban, what, what, what would that look like for girls? And it's important, um, it's an important question because for us to face um, the uh, harsh reality of the education crisis in Afghanistan, we need to look further back um, in order to be able to look forward into what the uh, um, uh, opportunities for solutions are. And 
even uh, in the past uh, 20 years of um, incredible investment in Afghanistan, um, only 34%, um, roughly 34% of Afghan girls uh, across the country were um, in school or had access to school. So a significant majority of Afghan girls um, were deprived of that opportunity um, to be in school. Um, there are a lot of reports um, that speak to um, some of the reasons behind, behind that. Obviously, um, under the umbrella of an incredibly corrupt system, um, but one of the major um, reasons why a lot of girls were not able to continue with their education in Afghanistan was a shortage of teachers and especially a shortage of female teachers, uh, followed by more than 60% of schools across Afghanistan um, did not have uh, access to water and sanitation facilities, which um, as you can understand, um, it is an explanation for why a lot of girls as they reached puberty um, dropped out of school significantly at that age. Um, we then also had um, issues such as a lack of distribution of books, schools lack basic materials. Um, it didn't stop girls and communities across Afghanistan from, uh, from teaching girls in open space in a lot of villages, uh, but shortage of, of books and stationery and um, teachers were a significant barrier. Uh, we obviously had other issues such as security and in some cases, um, traditional barriers, uh, beliefs that uh, prevented girls from um, uh, accessing education, but they were by no means the dominant factor. Um, so it is incredibly alarming um, that the Taliban are um, further limiting um, some of um, some of the criteria for what it would mean for girls to get back into school. And the most alarming one for me is um, the um, possibility that girls could only be taught by female teachers. Um, everyone understands that with, with such a condition, uh, even if sc schools were to reopen, um, a lot of girls will not be able to uh, sit in a classroom because we already have such a significant shortage of uh, female teachers. Um, like I said, this is a problem that we've had for a long time. So we need to think about what are some of the ways um, that it could be addressed. How can we how can we accelerate girls' access to um, education in a place like Afghanistan? Um, assuming, and this is a major assumption, uh, a lot of us are uh, remain incredibly um, concerned um, about the actual possibility of school reopening. Uh, time will tell. Uh, we have to wait. Um, well, be, part of the reason that we are concerned is that in, uh, like Dr. Saib Palwa Shajan mentioned, um, it, in the warmer uh, regions of Afghanistan, schools are meant to be in session, and yet those girls are not back in school. Mm -hmm. So um, our fixation on uh, schools opening in the colder region, um, you know, I am, I'm, I'm not yet convinced. I have to see it, uh, and then we'll believe it. But for, for the time being, um, there are many opportunities uh, to address um, girls' uh, access to education or accelerate it even in these difficult circumstances. Um, you look at, for instance, uh, Sola's model as, a, as an Afghan women-led uh, operated boarding school, an entirely Afghan women space. Um, we have, you know, it, it was no accident that we uh, have girls from 28 of the 34 provinces um, uh, represented by our student body. It meant um, that families from across Afghanistan um, believe in this model of education. Um, but if you look closely into some of these obstacles that girls face um, in different parts of the country, a boarding school model becomes a significant solution um, to some of these issues. Um, for instance, take a province uh, like Patika in southern Afghanistan, uh, where we have a significantly um, a low number of female teachers. I believe it's a handful of 16 uh, female teachers out of the 1,100 registered um, teachers with the Ministry of Education in the previous government. And 
out of those 16 female teachers, only one had a high school degree and five others had only completed elementary level education. So when you think about a province like Paktika um, and you add this, um, um, you, you know, you add this uh, additional condition that girls could, can only be taught by, by female teachers, um, who is going to go to school in Paktika? Uh, which are the girls that are gonna be able to access education? Um, uh, this becomes a catch-22. Um, if you don't have female teachers, you don't have female students in school. If you don't have female students graduating high school, you don't have the local production of female teachers. So how do you break this vicious cycle? Well, um, the possibility of a boarding school um, that is led entirely by um, educated Afghan women breaks that cycle and in, in fact accelerates girls' access to education. I have spoken to numerous um, uh, previous and directors of um, education uh, in most of these provinces where um, the percentage of female teacher was less than 20%, in most cases less than 5%. And a lot of them have spoken about uh, boarding school uh, or a boarding institute as a solution without even speaking, using the word boarding. Um, so there is a, a great desire by people um, and they, they do envision that if there is a space created for, um, that is truly led uh, by women, um, that families across Afghanistan would be willing to send their daughters um, to an institute or an institution where they can be educated and then go back to their provinces or their communities or their districts. Uh, where they can be the first generation of female teachers and, and break that cycle. Um, I will keep my remarks here, um, look forward to hearing from others, but um, uh, this for me um, is not a new, uh, it's not an idea, it's actually a proven model. We have seen it with Sola, we have seen um, the deep sense of commitment that families make to their daughter's education once they're enrolled in uh, Sola. Um, those families are by no means exceptional families in Afghanistan. I mean, for us, I do think that they are quite brave and uh, phenomenal families, but they represent people in their provinces. Um, Sola, after all, is one, one institution, and it should not be the only institution um, uh, of its kind. There should be many institutions like Sola um, addressing girls' education the way we do. Thank you. Thank you, Shabana, and thank you for um, setting the stage, so to speak, for uh, explaining the challenges uh, in uh, Afghanistan today in terms of the crisis in education for, for girls and women, uh, and also uh, one possible uh, workable uh, proven solution, uh, the one that you mentioned uh, that's based on the SOLA model. We're going to turn now to Pashtana Durrani a leading women's rights activist, teacher, and co-founder and executive director of Learn Afghanistan, an NGO focused on technology and very innovative means of getting schooling to rural areas across Afghanistan, particularly for girls. Through Learn, Pashtana hopes to expand access to STEM and reproductive health instruction to Afghan girls and refugees with little or no access to education. She too has been recognized for her work receiving the Talberg Award. Uh, she is currently a visiting fellow at Wellesley College. Pashtana, thank you for being with us today. Uh, I wonder if you could explain how technology uh, and innovation can be applied uh, to education, particularly given the crisis uh, in Afghanistan. Um, and I know that you're working on several projects. I wonder if in the work that you're doing, uh, you see potential for scaling up, uh, for expanding um, some of that work to addressing the challenges we've been hearing about. And, and maybe uh, just to throw in one more question, um, what is the international community getting wrong? Uh, what do you think uh, we can do better uh, to support more effective interventions uh, for education? 
Thank you, Ambassador. First of all, I would like to start with the fact that I would really want my daughter to go to Sola someday because that's like the dream. When I was young, I was in high school, so I was just done with my grade 10 and I applied for Sola and they actually wanted to interview me, but because of personal reasons, I couldn't further pursue in Sola. So I would really want my daughter to go to Sola school someday or my sister. Uh, so uh starting on more um more of the uh, things that uh, we work with or the way we function um in in a general sense i do echo what palwasha says or what shabana says which is yes every girl has right to education every girl should have that public space access to that public space um she should be able to go to a boarding school she should be able to go to a public school she should be able to access all those educational opportunities that is universal in every other country no matter how, what their gdp is what their uh, religion is or the way they function because education is uh, a right a universal right especially for girls when it comes to learn, I like to say that it's more like um, an emergency situation thing or more like model towards countries um, or areas that are that are challenging, right? That are conflict uh, ridden or that need some sort of intervention, uh, which needs answer uh, for that um, sort of tough questions. Um, in Afghanistan right now, one thing that we are doing right now is we are running these uh, secret schools in uh, different provinces, and we hope to expand to Tahar, Mazar, Faryab, Bamiyan, and Nangarhar. And these regions that we are working with right now, and as Shabana said, um, or Palasha said that in the past, in the past six years, we have seen what, what the Taliban, there were secret schools, right? And uh, even right now, all these institutions reaching out to us from all these places are actually these uh, community leaders. They want to reach out to us. We are not reaching out to anyone. They are the ones who want to educate their daughters. They are the ones they want to see someone leading their community the way Shabana leaves it, Dima leaves it, Palwasha leaves it, or Parsana leaves it. You have to understand that Afghanistan is not a country that is hostile towards girls' education. It's political ideology, small group of men, conservative men, who tend to politicize girls' education because that's the easiest one to do. The second thing that we need to understand is the fact that when it comes to learn, we focus more on STEM, but I also focus a lot on learning opportunities. I personally think a girl's voice becomes important when she starts earning, especially in an Afghan household. Um, I have seen it again and again until she's not earning. Uh, she can be a PhD she won't be respected in her family. She could be wed off uh, as early as 16 and nobody would even listen. In order to talk at the men's table, you have to earn like a man. I always say it, which is very misogynistic, but it is reality. Um, and this is something true. I come from a very conservative tribal family. My father passed away uh, a year ago, and I'm going to give my example because it's uh, something that I experienced. The first thing I remember was the fact that my uncle's taking over and telling me, oh, we will handle it and everything but no they couldn't handle it they were supposed to marry me off my sister off and like you know my brother was gonna take care of the farm and the land and everything why why should that happen right why should every woman face that fate if someone from her family a father or a patriarch has to pass away now that can happen to a lot of Pashtunas in afghanistan and it might be happening you wouldn't even know i had to take the lead because i was earning I was running my own nonprofit. I was earning, I was leading, I was working twice as hard to put my sister and my brother to the school. Um, and I was working twice as hard to get whatever my father left us in equality because he was like, I want my daughter and son to have the same equality. The reason I'm giving you this example and I never talk about this is the fact that how many more Pashtunas have to go through that misogyny, even in normal uh, places without the Taliban to get to the position, to protect their siblings, to protect their families, to get food on the table and actually help uh, their own families bring out of poverty. That's the reason we need an education that actually feeds families. The reason we focus, the reason we educate 100 leaders per province, so those 100 leaders could actually get educated, start having freelancing jobs, 
start stabilizing 100 families uh, uh, out of poverty. And then those 100 families and those 100 girls start teaching another 100 girls. And then the snowball effects come into the rolling. And that's how you create leaders in Afghanistan. That's how you depend on women leaders. When they have the financial stability, they can then talk and negotiate other terms. Now, on scaling, yes, we are scaling, and I'm hoping to scale to all the 34 provinces. Um, I don't want to sound very Ashravani because you used to have this model where it's provinces and then it's districts and then it's villages, <laughs> but I think it's doable. <laughs> Maybe I'm just too passionate. <laughs> so on districts level, uh, uh, on a provincial level, we are expanding this year. Within districts level, we hope to expand within the next two years. And on village level, we hope to expand within the next five years. I personally believe there should be a space uh, where, uh, so uh, when we come from a village and in our village, and uh, there was always a place where all the women would gather around and have chai and talk and like, you know, gossip and everything or talk poetry or talk about the radio shows that they would listen to. I personally think we could recreate those same spaces with digital spaces where girls come together, they have chai, but then at the same time, they continue learning, they do freelancing jobs. That digital lab is highly equipped with solar panels so that electricity is not an issue. We are already working on internet solution that hopefully Afghanistan will have within the next one year. We'll have internet all across Afghanistan, but free internet, FYI, and fast internet, I promise. And last but not the least, digital devices there is a huge digital divide even in the us when it comes to digital devices not every girl has access to that high technology so right now i hope to do that within the next five years for each village but within the next year for the whole uh, afghanistan's provincial capitals that's the goal that's the dream we teach them simple things freelancing graphics designing website development logo development um translating for people um translating assisting people with their jobs and everything at the same time we teach them normal stuff like bio physics chemistry pashto dari um i'm hoping to expand someday to uzbeki i'm very passionate about it so these are the sort of things that we teach general curriculum but also a curriculum that would help them earn in the long run now, this model works in a sense where Afghanistan is coming into a economic crisis. It's also facing a lot of harsh conditions and we are going to be seeing a lot of child marriages because a girl's worth is all in her young body. So in order to combat that, when a girl starts earning, nobody would want that money out of the family. That's the reality. Now, on, now that I have answered the scaling question, International community, I have a lot of criticism for them, but I think I would uh, limit myself to what can be done instead of criticizing them. I think international community has to focus on what uh, Shabana said, said that you have to let the Afghan women lead. You have to let them do what is best for Afghanistan. You can't take that space. You can't talk on our behalf. We have to talk on our behalf. We have to do our own fight. We need, I wouldn't say we need a table or uh, we need a chair uh, uh, on that table, a seat on that table. We demand that because that is my right. You know, in Pashto, we say kawala, which is like, you know, having a, a, right, a rightful peoples to the land. I had that for my father's lands and that's why I can own them. That's the same thing I have for Afghanistan. That's the same thing Palwasha has, Dima has, Shabana has, or Maria has for Afghanistan, for our regions, for our communities. We belong to those communities. Our Taskirat belong to those communities. We know how our context works. So let us do the talking. Let us talk uh, with the Taliban. Let's, uh, let us talk with the international community. Let us lead the educational models instead of uh, donating billions and billions to people who would go and get paid 17, 18, 25 thousand dollars for working in a conflict zone for what? Protect me, I'll go back and I'll work, but protect me, you know, because I'm the only breadwinner in my family. So the same goes for a lot of other women. They don't want to abandon their countries. You didn't see us back in the day in the US, right? You're seeing us right now because I was not allowed to go to my office post August. I was not allowed to go to the bank by myself. I was not allowed to work with my own staff. So we have to understand that what the international community best can do, A, recognize our effort, amplify our work, 
most importantly, and I'm going to see it again and again, donate and fund things that actually work, that actually show you results, that actually shows you how many girls have learned, how many girls are in learning, how much can it be uh, scaled, how much it progresses. Stuff like this is very important for us to understand. And most importantly, enable the dialogue. Let us talk, do the talking instead of talking on my behalf. I'm going to stop here. And yeah, thank you. Well, thank you so much, uh, Pashtana. You have uh filled your space with an awful lot of uh, good ideas, a lot of enthusiasm, I must say, as well. Uh, but but that's what Onward Afghan Women is all about. Let Afghan women lead, and that is something uh, that we should all make possible. Uh, and I think your work on uh, closing the digital divide uh, and, and very much the education contributing to economic empowerment uh, very, very uh, important uh, lessons in all of that. We're going to turn now to Adima Haram, a longtime champion for rights of women and girls to an education in Afghanistan. Adima is currently serving as the program implementation manager of the Afghan Women's Educational Center. She's been working to re-enroll girls who were affected by the conflict uh, into, in, back into school and to address the barriers that girls face to education in Afghanistan. Adima has also received much recognition, including the Malala Fund Gulmake Champion Award, and she has spoken before the UN. So Dima, it's really great uh, to have you with us because you do a lot of that hands-on work. Um, and I wonder if you could, um, Give us a sense of what's happening on the ground. I know that you're in touch uh, with many Afghans and civil society organizations. Uh, what are they telling you about the challenges that they're confronting? Um, and then back to the international community again, uh, what advice would you have? There are uh, many who would like to collaborate uh, with civil society organizations uh, and support their efforts in education, uh, like paying, uh, for teacher salaries, for example. How, do was, how does one ensure that these kinds of interventions, uh, hopefully good interventions, will have the impact that one desires? Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador. I'm, uh, it's been it's an honor to be part of this important event. And, uh, and coming to your questions like, uh, Awake or Afghan Women's Educational Center has a, um, or Awake um, is working as a woman led organization. Besides other sectors, it's working in education for the last 30 years. Implemented different education projects in almost more than 10 provinces of Afghanistan. Awake is involved in different clusters in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan including humanitarian clusters or gender based uh, violence, GBV clusters, or education and emergency working groups. Uh, through these colors clusters, AWIC is using these clusters to share the actual needs of the communities, particularly voices from the women and girls from a very grassroots level to the national international communities and advocating for their rights. Unfortunately, after the fall of Afghanistan education system, especially closing school girls by the new government, although after a period, they re re reopened the schools for the primary level, but the secondary and high schools are still not allowed to be open. We did many follow-ups through different channels or platforms for advocating and reopening of schools for secondary and high school for girls. However, it's always been learned from the new government that they are working in some sort of uh, new policies for the secondary schools for girls. Uh, the policies, although the policies are not shared and publicly declared, moreover, they announced that all schools for girls, including secondary and high schools, will be reopened by the start of this new year. However, there are rumors that the curriculums for the secondary and high school of girls will be changed. Uh, as for a week's understanding of the ground, close of schools, particularly for girls, cause many issues, cause psychological problems for girls. In addition to being in prison at home for the long time, they are also not, they are also not optimistic for their results of education and their future. 
like there are many questions that uh, that uh, that girls are uh, are thinking about like will our education be same as other like will our education be the same as other educated women or it will be different will we will we will be able to pass the entrance exam while we are away from education for about one year what will be our future we have not been able to take any courses or school at all. Majority of families can afford, cannot, cannot afford the education of their children uh, because the change of power, the Taliban negatively affected the income of people. Most of families cannot provide food and basic necessities for themselves and their children. They will not be able to send their daughters to school at all. Uh, on the other side, security is the other issue that girls and their parents are worried about. The girls and the girls and their families do not have trust in the Taliban due to unavailability of proper military uniform of forces of Taliban. Families fear that armed groups still exist around their areas. They cannot trust them. Conflicts can occur any time. This means that a number of families are still not mentally ready to send their daughters to school. However, their announcement relevant uh, to opening of schools for girls made people, especially girls, hopeful that uh, they will go to school by the start of New Year. However, their policies is not clear for the people to trust them and the uh, international communities to support the schooling system of Afghanistan. And, uh, and, uh, to, and in response to your second question, like uh, this problem needs impactful and sustainable solution to maintain the schooling system, particularly uh, schooling system, particularly for girls, Besides budgeting for other sectors, the new government should have appropriate and sustainable support for education system. Since Afghanistan does not have a stable economy, this means the support of international communities and donors, which is negatively affected by the decisions of global actors relevant to the recognition of Taliban's government. Uh, in order to have sustainable solution and attract international donors, the multilateral and government actors can have significant roles in different levels and ways, like international, international donors. Uh, international donors uh, should increase the percentage of funding towards education, particularly for, educa for, uh, for, uh, particularly for girls' education, for long, for long term, because Afghanistan needs more funding and support in education sector as compared to recent two decades. Although UNICEF played a pay uh, the salary, like although uh, UNICEF planned to pay the salaries of Afghan teachers without transferring funds to the government, it has both positive and negative impact. It's positive is that somehow some teachers are receiving their salaries and unable to resume their activities and continue their work. Uh, but on the other side, they think this fund will stop depend, depending on the struggles of Taliban for recognition or mm -hmm. continuation of this process will make teachers dependent on international support and will limit the influence of government, which is realized by the by Taliban as well. In the short run, um, this process works, but it is not the real solution for the problem. Moreover, the national NGOs have played significant role has bridged between the people and the donor who can further focus on education for girls. This will enable the local NGOs to sustain their rules in providing educational services, particularly to girls. Second, US government and allies can make the recognition of government of Taliban conditional to girls' education. The recognition of their government by the US and its allies have paramount importance to Taliban, which is affecting the decision of other countries. Therefore, it should be used as a force to oblige Taliban change their policies related to girls' education, which is the actual needs of people. Moreover, 
Taliban claim that uh, uh, they have prepared policy for girls' education to start all girls' school for the new year, about which people are not sure. Uh, people can't trust uh, that the Taliban will stick to their promises. Therefore, it's an appropriate time to force Taliban to openly declare and share their policy with people and international communities to understand their intention. Thus, it's important, to, for, important for US and its allies to understand the policy of Taliban about girls' education and decide accordingly. And uh, third, uh, Muslim countries involved in politics of Afghanistan have, have close link with Taliban. These uh, countries can also play a vital role in this regard. They are, always, they are also following the same Islamic Sharia implementing in their respective countries. Their women and girls can access to all the fundamental human rights, such as education, employment, or movement, or participating in various governmental or non-governmental sectors. Therefore, these countries can negotiate with Taliban and convince them to be flexible and implement the actual Islamic laws where all human beings can access their human rights equally. Moreover, these countries can provide the example of their context where women and girls go to school and universities, workplace, participate in decision-making and work in all areas where their presence is important as human, as citizen of that country. Uh, by this, I stop my remarks. Uh, thank you. Dima, thank you so much. And thank you for those very concrete recommendations, both in terms of conditionality and education, uh, but also the call to predominantly Muslim countries uh, where they uh, see Islam as a mandate for education, for learning, for knowledge, uh, and not this extreme view, radical view that the Taliban have and can potentially uh, be more influential than they've been uh, because they do not uh, uh, agree to the same kind of uh, <clears throat> views of uh, educating girls and women. So I think those are very good points and there may be follow-up questions on that. <coughs> Excuse me, we're gonna turn now to um, Maria Rahin. We're going to look at higher education uh, she is a champion for women's education and political participation, most recently as director of journalism and mass communication at Balkh University. Earlier, she founded the Taj Higher Education Institute, the first private university in Balkh, uh, which offered courses in medicine, economics, and the law. She's also the founder of uh, the VR organization of Balkh province, whose aim is to address human rights violations and barriers that prevent women from accessing, uh, accessing their basic rights. Uh, Maria, it's very good to have you with us as well, particularly also to be able to um, fill out this discussion in many ways uh, by focusing on the state of higher education. Uh, what is happening at this time uh, in higher education? Are women able uh, to continue their university uh, education? Uh, what are you hearing from your fellow faculty and uh, administrators who remain uh, in Afghanistan? And what should the international community uh, be doing to support uh, access to higher education? I know your, your daughter uh, is uh, per, per, per Parnian is going to uh, help uh, with the translation. Uh, so you will speak in your language and then we'll hear from her in English. Uh, so thanks to the two of you. Uh, and uh, we look forward to your responses. <laughs> تنها حقیقتی که زنوره در افغانستان امروز تا به امی ستیج رسانده که بدون خوف بدون کدام خطر از طالبا حق آزادی و حق کار خودم بخواین تحصیل و دانش زن است. So the only fact which got Afghan women at this stage that today they're asking for their rights from the Taliban without any fear is their knowledge and education. 
20 سال گذشته بر زنای افغانستان فرصت های بسیار خوب را برای آگاهی و بر سواد به گونه عالی می اثر ساخته بود و این در این 20 سال زنا تانستن که دستاوردهای خوب داشته باشن In the past 20 years there was chances for women to get awareness and literacy in its highest form یک گروه از کارشناسا در وزارت معارف و از وزارت تحصیلات عالی یک تحقیق را انجام دادن که به اساس از او تحقیق بعضی آمار نشر شد که آمار واقعا نسبت به زنها یعنی نسبت به کاری که زنها کرده بودن خوشبینی بسیار زیاد نشان میداد Some researches were done recently which shows a very good um which shows uh, some good news is about the um rate of the literacy between afghan women in afghanistan dari taqiq omada ke dar 20 sal dar hudud 50 darsad zanan daray sawad hayati hastan yani amu sawad ibtidai ra ke bayad dashta bashan 40 darsad farig sanf 12 30 darsad lisans va taqriban 5 darsad master و یک فیصد هم ما دکترای زن در افغانستان داشتیم. These researches shows that approximately in the last 20 years we have had 50% women with basic elementary literacy, 40% high school graduates and 1% in the doctoral stage. کی بر جامعه جنگ زده مثل افغانستان واقعا یک دستاورد و فوق العاده است which is absolutely great in a war turned society like afghanistan اخیرا بی بی سی گزارش نشر کرد که دو از بیرون شدن 229 تن از استادا از سه دانشگاه معتبر افغانستان که کابل و بلخ و ایرات است خبر میداد که بیرون شدن از این کادر علمی واقعا روند تحصیلی را صدمه میزنه. Recently BBC reported that the exit of 229 teachers from three credible universities of Afghanistan, Kabul, Balkh and Herat universities. Lack of this scientific staff damages the educational process. تمامی از این استادایی که بیرون شدن دارای رتبه علمی ماستری و دکترا بودند. و هر کدامشان بیشتر از ده سال تجربه کاری در قسمت تدریس داشتند. Because each of these teachers had masters or doctoral degrees and had experience of more than 10 years. و شاید به همین خاطر هم است که دانشگاه تا هنوز بسته مانده هرچند که ظاهرا در مناطق گرمسیر گفتن دانشگاه باز شده ولی عملا محصلی که در اونجا برای تحصیل بره وجود نداره and maybe this is why the governmental universities are still closed در حال حاضر تنها مؤسسات خصوصی در افغانستان ارائه خدمات تحصیلی میکنن right now only the private institutions are providing studies for the students مگر در مؤسسات خصوصی تحصیلی یک تعداد بسیار کم دخترها میتونن تحصیل کنن but only a few number of girls can afford studying in private institutions. Because all the services they offer is with the fees that the students should pay. شرایط اقتصادی مردم در افغانستان بعد نیست که بتوانند به حمایت تحصیلی دختران خود ادامه بدهند. And now the financial situation in Afghanistan is not in a stage that the families can afford supporting their girls to go to the private institutions to continue studying. Libraries are closed. Because of the uh, because of the lack of active internet system, online studies are hard to provide. و بالاخره جدا شدن سنوف سنوف و استادای زن و مرد بالاخره مشکلات را در زمینه تحصیل در درون افغانستان به وجود آورده and finally the separation of male and female teachers and students have problems in this field همچنان که 
نبود امنیت مناسب و دو دستگی که در بین خود طالبا وجود داره باعث میشه که آنها از شروع کردن دانشگاه ایراس داشته باشد. Also, lack of proper security and partition of the Taliban that prevent them from starting any major movement because به خاطر که امکان داره روند جدید انتحار و انفجار و قتل را زیر نام داعش در افغانستان جریان بده و این مخالفت های درونیشان این پروسه را مختل بسازه because it is possible that a new process of explosions and killings will take place under the name of ISIS and their internal opposition will severely damage the process. Quasi job age bori wa barkh masail dini ghair zaruri bar ustadan zan miz az tahdid kunande hay irawand as. The imposition of compulsory hijab and some unnecessary religious issues on female teachers and students are also treating this process. همچنان دست به دست شدن مدیریت منابع علمی به افراد غیر مسئول و مسلکی هم از مشکلات دیگر این بخش است. Handing over the management of scientific resources to unprofessional people is another problem in this sector. نبود علاقمندی برای پیش برد کار علمی معصر به دلیل وضع نامناسب کاست فیصدی معاشات استادان و نبود زمینه های رفاعی اتا به سطح ابتدایی ترس، تهدید، تغییر انسانی، لط و کوب، کل کردن موی، زدن دستار اتمی بر رستادا و همچنان کردارای افراتی است که شوق تحصیل در بین محصلین، در بین دخترا و بچه های جوان از بین برده. Lack of interest in advancing effective scientific work due to the unfavorable situation the percentage reduction of professor salaries and the lack of refinement fields even in the elementary level. Fair treats, humiliations, beatings, and forced haircuts on boys are extremism that destroys the desire for education, like the separation of boys and girls classes. I'm <laughs> طالبا می خواهند که سنفای دختر و بچه حتما باید جدا باشه و این جدیدن برای سیستم تحصیلات عالی در سه شهر مهم افغانستان ننگرها رو بلخ و کابل چار شهر و مزار پیشنهاد شده بر رؤسای ایشان که باید این سنفا جدا شوند In recently Taliban have officially asked the three credible universities in Afghanistan four credible universities in Afghanistan Kabul, Balkh, Herat, and Ngarhar universities to separate the boys and girls classes, which have its own problems in this field. Even the teachers for these classes must be separated. The girls should be educated by female teachers and the boys should be educated by male teachers. و این یک مشکل جدی است به خاطر که ما ممکن است یک نفر استاد زن در یک مضمون داریم که او در مو اسپشالیست است متخصص است یک مرد نمیتونه کور تدریس کنه This is a very serious problem because we have an expert teacher in a subject that can teach a class and this is really important that we have only one teacher and she she can only teach now the girls and who is going to teach the boys or like this for the boys we have one teacher that can teach that that has an expertise in a field and now he's only able to teach the boys now who is going to teach the girls uh, ولكنهم <تصفيق> So um, she has spoken with uh, many professors in Balkh, Kabul, and Herat, and Nangarhar universities, and they have said that the only active studying option for the students right now 
is the reopening of the public university gates for them. و گزینه دوم هم چنان تحصیلات عالی در انستیتودای خصوصی است. And the next option is the private institutions. برای شروع شدن هر دو گزینه ما ضرورت داریم تا جامعه و املل سر طالبا فشار وارد بکنه تا اونا در وضعه های دانشگاه را باز بکنه. First starting the both options, we need the international society to put pressure on Taliban so that they open the university gates for the students. و به خاطر تحصیل در گزینه های خصوصی همچنان ما باید از طریق منابع خیریه کورسی های را بر دخترها آماده بسازیم. And for the education and private institutions, we have to um, we have to provide some assistance from the charities for the girls who can't afford studying in the private institutions. تاکید میکنم نهادهایی که در بخش تحصیلات عالی در سطح بین المللی کار میکنن باید در داخل افغانستان کار کنند تا زمینی ادغام دختران با مؤسسات خصوصی و دانشگاه های دولتی عملا به وجود بیاید. I emphasize the institutions that work in the field of higher education at the international level they must work inside Afghanistan to create the condition for girls to be integrated into private institutions and public colleges. Without global support, one cannot do that. Without the support of the world, it is not only the support of the education system. The system of the education system is the system of the Taliban, the system of the system of the modern and the academic system. Because the education system provided by the Taliban is non-modern, non-academic system. آموزش آنلاین البته یک پیشنهاد بسیار خوب است ما تمام ظرفیت های علمی که می فعلا در بیرون از افغانستان هستند می توانیم با یک فراخوان اینا رو بسیج کنیم و آنها آموزش آنلاین از هر کشور که هستند آغاز کنند آنلاین ادویکیشن از ا گود سجشن وی کن موبلایز اول دی ساینتیفیک پروفشنلز دات ار اوتساید افغانستان اند دی کن استارت آنلاین لکچرز از ان اکسترا کریکولر ادویکیشن یک اصطلاحی بسیار مشهور است آموزش بیرون دانشگاهی البته ما میتونیم که ای در سای آنلاین به عنوان آموزش بیرون دانشگاهی همچنان با یک اصطلاح جدید وارد افغانستان کنیم We can get these lectures inside Afghanistan as an extracurricular curricular education it's a new system ولی در داخل افغانستان تنها با فشار وارد کردن به طالبا که باید به حق منطقی دخترها و پسرها رسیدگی شوه میتونیم در وضعه های دانشگاه را باز کنیم که البته محدودیت های خود را داره Inside Afghanistan we can only open the public gates of universities by putting pressure on the Taliban which of course has its own limitations تشکر Yeah, that was all Well, that was a great deal, Maria and thank you so much uh, for that overview of the situation in higher education, uh, both what the Taliban attitudes and their actions uh, are doing really to destroy uh, higher education. <clears throat> and in terms of uh, the concrete actions that are necessary now to reverse that, because the stakes are so high for Afghanistan, if that does not happen. Uh, and I think your words about interventions with the Taliban on this very point uh, in terms of integrating girls and women more significantly, um, as well as online possibilities and, uh, and supports that are gonna be cri critically needed if public education in higher ed is not gonna be uh, possible. So thank you for that. And, and thank you, Parnia, for your translation. Uh, and now we're gonna move to our questions. Um, from our, our participants today who've been listening in and I'm sure have lots of questions and I'll turn uh, to Ali uh, to tell us what those questions are. And anybody uh, who wants to answer it, just uh, give us a notice, raise your hand or, or hit the icon for raise hand. Sure, the first one uh, asks, a big claim of the Taliban is that they have no objection to education for women but there is a lack of women teachers and classes must be segregated. Shibana and others covered this as a major barrier and called for the SOLA model as a workaround. But is there a solution through the formal education system? 
Um, and as a related question, should the international community be focusing on former channels, like interventions adhering to the Taliban's understanding of Sharia education, or should they be focusing on informal mechanisms that provide education for girls outside of the Taliban system? Okay, who wants to tackle that first, Shivana? Uh, sure, I, I think um, in, in a way submitting to Taliban's demand that girls should only be taught by um, female teachers or professors is just simply unrealistic. Um, uh, this, is, this is purely an excuse on their part. They understand that this is a major problem in Afghanistan that already existed. And the, the truth is that the practice of Islam in Afghanistan predates the birth of Taliban as a movement. So they cannot pretend um, that they have the upper hand in Islamic teachings or way of life in Afghanistan. People in Afghanistan are Muslims. They, they have been practicing Islam for a very long time. Uh, prior to the Taliban, there have been demands for um, the classroom environment to be within uh, Afghan cultural and Islamic norms, and they have been. Um, so uh, questioning this idea of women being taught only by female um, teachers or professors um, is important. There needs to be a pushback. Afghans are pushing back on that. Is there is there a preference in some parts of Afghanistan for that? Sure. Should that be respected? Yes, uh, in order to open opportunities for girls. But that cannot be norm. It should never be written into a law because it's already quite limiting. Like uh, uh, Professor Maria mentioned, um, you have certain expertise that are that are with male professors or teachers and not with female professors or teachers, and, and they need to be taken advantage of. At the end of the day, we, <laughs> we, we don't live in our silos as men or women. Um, uh, professional women, professional men also need to be able to learn to interact in that space. Um, it, it, you know, what, so what happens once, once you get out of academia? Um, women can't be working in professional space just with other women. So there needs to be a realistic approach and pushback. And quite honestly, the Taliban's uh, demand for curriculum reform, they don't have the capacity. This is such a huge undertaking um, that even in, in the previous administration with a lot of international expertise and support involved, it was already a significant challenge. Um, so for them, the only under the guise of a curriculum reform or challenge what we, or change what we will get is a extreme um, radical um, uh, version of a curriculum that will be taught in schools uh, similar to what we saw under the first Taliban regime. And obviously, um, under no circumstances, people in Afghanistan uh, would want to accept that and I wouldn't recommend um, that we easily work with, with, with a solution like that. Anyone else want to add to that? Otherwise, we'll go on to the next question, Ali. Sure, this is from a State Department official asking, if the international community agrees to pay teachers stipends, but six months from now, girls are only able to attend schools in some, but not all of the provinces. Should the international community continue to pay teacher stipends? What other quote unquote sticks should they be considering in this carrot and sticks approach? Anyone? This is a, a much asked question. I'm happy to, uh provide an opinion and I would love to hear others uh, thoughts but I think this idea of providing stipend um, uh, first of all I have to caution that um, as an Afghan in exile um, I, I understand my limitation of having opinions on this at the end of the day honestly the people should, who should be consulted on, on, a, on a question like this are, are Afghans currently in Afghanistan um, but I would say um, providing a stipend uh, for teachers, especially considering every other uh, dimension of the problem in Afghanistan with the, um, the catastrophe that Afghanistan is right now, the um, absolute collapse of economic system in Afghanistan. Um, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful initiative. Um, I know that there, were, there are some mechanisms where this could be potentially monitored uh, with, the, with the previous uh, 
uh, government, uh, there were efforts uh, put in place to um, collect biometric data on on uh, teacher teacher self, civil servants. Um, I know that was not uh, uh, completed, but um, the former um, Minister of Education leadership should be consulted on what was done. Um, they will be in a best, best position to answer that. Um, but uh, even uh, providing providing that uh, stipend to teachers, it accomplishes a few things. It allows teachers to be able to maintain some economic stability in their household, to be able to continue to um, teach, um, even if they um, don't teach right now, if they're in colder regions of, um, of Afghanistan because of the winter break. Um, it's a way of keeping them engaged. Um, this is obviously not talking evidence-based, but this is really just common sense. Um, and um, it should be, um, obviously there are questions around, uh, does it really get in the hands of teachers? That's a whole separate question. And it, it does remain a challenge when you don't have um, uh, monitoring boots on the ground um, to ensure that it actually, it, that, that fund is actually going to um, the teachers. But this is where you could work with um, international organizations and other NGOs uh, working in Afghanistan uh, to ensure um, some level of monitoring and that these um, stipends are in fact uh, getting in the hands of um, teachers. Um, I would, I would, I would be on the side of um, agreeing with with a with a you know a providing stipend to teachers, and I will let Pashtana take it from here. Go ahead, Pashtana. Thank you, Sharana. I totally agree with her on the fact that, yes, you have to pay the teachers, especially female teachers who have given their life uh, to work as hard as they can to educate the girls in Afghanistan. I was talking to a teacher who was working with us in public school when we were working and I was asking her, it's like, what are you doing? And she's like, you know, I still go to the school. I still get engaged. I still talk to the principal and she's an IT teacher who's teaching in our private school right now. And she's like, I still continue to be engaged. I talk to the girls and hopefully things will resolve. So there is a hope for things, even if it's not on political sites, it's within the community of Afghan girls right now, especially uh, sticks. I have a lot of suggestions on that. Um, the sticks would be A, uh, smart sanctions. Stop sanctioning Afghanistan, start sanctioning Taliban, start sanctioning people who are in charge. Um, they, don't want to go, they don't want to let girls educate. They don't want them to travel to the school. Don't let them travel the world. Don't let them fly to Norway. That the best thing. That's the best thing you could do. You literally put them uh, out of the uh, no-fly list, or I don't know. I don't remember that. But that was a big controversy, right? In the UN, they put them out. Why don't you put them back on that list? That's smart sanction for you, right there. Um, apart from that, mm, channels uh money channels uh for example what are what is the sort of uh economic support that they are getting from china russia pakistan iran sanction those countries ask those countries why are you doing that ask them like you know you have to bully them because they are literally supporting terrorists right now um those are the smart things you could do those are the sticks that you could do as a leader of the world and apart from that for every time there is a retaliation you always see this pattern and i do want to highlight it every time there is an extrajudicial abuse every time there is a girl goes missing every time um girls education is uh, uh, put on hold every time you see teachers uh, being put on hold and their uh, work put on hold and there's always a, sto a story revolving around uh, the group uh, the regime right now and them doing something else you have to make sure that you follow up you have a monitor a rapporteur like you know that's the only privilege between the us and afghans right now that you have a passport with a country that's going to stand up for you and we have passports with a country that literally is banning our kind and there's a gender apartheid going on so you have to monitor the change that is happening but also monitor with uh, the sticks so for example within the next six months if girls schools are not open in all regions start sanctioning the leaders in those regions all those taliban they shouldn't get money for anything uh, all those channels that are supporting them right now you could do that easily you could have done that in the past two decades but you didn't do so at least do it right now those are the sticks you could do yeah and Paul Washi, did you want to add anything? 
uh, yeah, thank you. Um, besides, um, I think the uh, very important point that uh, Shabana and uh, uh, Pashtana has mentioned uh, that the uh, stipend to the teacher should continue even if students are not attending because we should know that we are, uh, people has lost their job, especially women in Afghanistan lost their jobs. So if any of these salaries are going, that's important to be kept. But it's also important, I think all the panelists has given uh, all the description. It's not only um, a one reason uh, that is stopping uh, girls from going to school. It's the policy, it's the fear, it is the terror, uh, several other aspects, unless the families are, um, uh, contained with the situation, they probably will create problem uh, for girls to go to school. So I think uh, we also have to give some of these support, uh, humanitarian support through these schools. So the family can have uh, benefited uh, and the school uh, be seen as places where uh, what Pashtana was mentioning uh, about economic incentive and all that, it's also important to make these schools useful uh, in a different sense to the community who are passing through multiple challenges. Um, and uh, we have to, in this way, encourage girls going to school, um, uh, looking to a broader uh, uh, challenges, not just like, okay, teachers doesn't have salary, so that's why school work close. There are more than that to it. Good point. Uh, all of these issues are complex, but I think uh, it's fair to sum this uh, response by let's not penalize the teachers, let's sanction those who are perpetrating a negative behavior and keeping girls out of school. Uh, Ali, next question, please. Sure, this question is asking about curriculum. We know that the, some schools will be opening in a couple months. Are you hearing anything about specifically what the curriculum could be for women and girls? And then another question here uh, related, what form of Islamic jurisprudence does the Taliban use in their guidance regarding education for women and girls? How can we integrate an understanding of these frameworks into the solutions that have been discussed? And are there arguments from Hanafi jurisprudence you would like to note that could be applied in these conversations? Alasha, please, you wanna start us off? Uh, yeah. Um, as far as Taliban are considered, in theory, you should follow the uh, Hanafi jurisprudence. Uh, but there is a lot of contradiction when it comes to the practices. For instance, uh, uh, female judges uh, is one of uh, the, uh, the only school which is supporting is that is the Hanafi school of thought or the religious sect that is supporting uh, them. And in Afghanistan, this has been banned. So I think it's very much a conservative ruler perspective or uh, what has been taught in some of the madrasas uh, uh, in Pakistan where uh, Taliban has went through that. And besides like even I would question that because for uh, last 20 years and most of them are young men who have been in war, I don't think even they had that opportunity to go through a proper uh, madrasa education. So uh, there is a confusion. And I've been advising in um, um, some of my talks that Taliban also have to educate their own people on Islam, uh, and that's important for them. Um, uh, in Hanafi school, there is a lot of opportunity for women, um, so, uh, social uh, and public life, including that they could be uh, teachers or um, judges, uh, which is uh, probably restricted in a lot of other schools and uh, some of the Islamic practices. Pakistan, for instance, for the first time have a female judge, but in Afghanistan, we had that for, uh, I don't know, maybe over 60 years now. Um, uh, so we have to go back to reverse to our own practices. Uh, and um, as our panelists were saying, Islam has been practiced in Afghanistan much before even a Taliban structure came into uh, existence. And that is only within these last 40 years that these um, uh, extreme Islamic and militant groups has come to existence. And uh, every, everything here is very much Islamic in Afghanistan. And we have to go back to touch our roots and the beliefs that we already had in our country. So I will stop here. 
Uh, thank you, Paul Washa. And, and I, I just want to say that part of the work uh, that we're doing at the Georgetown Institute is work with scholars on this very issue uh, and really uh, making available uh, both in, in language and in, in content uh, the, the, uh, the ability for uh, Afghans to be able to grasp how women's rights are consistent with Islam. Uh, because what we hear from the Taliban for all the reasons we've been uh, discussing today uh, is that their view is a radical extreme view and one not shared by, by most of the predominantly Muslim countries, if not all of them. Uh, so that tool will be available and hopefully of use uh, to the broader community. Another question, please. Yep, this question is for Pashtana asking, are you facing pushback from the Taliban on your programs? Um, considering they are widely open across Afghanistan, is there resistance or security concerns and how are you reaching this many girls? Um, and a question for Dima on gender norms, asking even before the Taliban took over, women and girls faced barriers to accessing education, including deep seated gender norms and needing family permission to attend school. Is anything working to address these issues and what more is needed? Okay, so let's start with Pashtana on pushback. Uh, with the, the school that we have in Kandar, uh, honestly, that's an, an underground school and a lot of security checks are already taken. Um, in order for girls to go to school. And uh, most of the time it's an institution in a very community led place. Um, so that's very important for us. So like, you know, it's much more secure, I would say. On the implementing partner side in Kabul, um, they have already got the permission because they run different sort of classes and our classes are embedded in those classes. So those are the two things that we are, I'm, I'm, I'm able to share. I can't share more details, but one thing that I am gonna say is that um, the Taliban don't know about our operations overall. It's a secret school. It's not an open school where Taliban know that this is a school where girls go and get educated they don't so yeah and apart from that i just wanted to uh, mention uh, lightly about the two things uh, i saw a comment where she's like um, the person asked uh, the model educational or the internet model doesn't work um, right now afghanistan if you do your research afghanistan rural areas have 365 days of sun which enables us to access uh, solar panels if we check the last year's new zealand um, a model that where they created electric parks in Afghanistan, solar parks actually, and they were actually very useful for all the agricultural channels because we use that for our cube wells and uh, we did our research. So now the schools are actually using solar panels to help answer the electricity issue, even if we don't get uh, electricity from Uzbekistan or Tajikistan anymore, we can help that navigate through solar panels and it's useful, very useful. The second thing is about internet. We are right now working with uh, the SIM card companies to ensure that there are bytes available offline and you can do it anytime you go on Rumi website, you can download the PDF and that's it. You don't need more internet for it. Apart from that, we already have an offline app that's usable in video, audio, writing and reading format. So that's also something that you need to know. Last but not the least, Afghanistan maybe, maybe will be the first country to be able to access free internet. I can't disclose the partners, but that will be happening within the next one year. Last but not the least, we are supposed to be um, uh, launching our radio uh, lessons within the next two weeks. And that not only enables us to reach a wider uh, region, but it also helps us uh, read or uh, reach all sorts of students who cannot access education in all walks of life. So all those things are solutions that you could be ensuring or like, you know, answering or using or exploring just uh, to answer the lack of education opportunities right now. Yeah. And uh, Dima, can you take up the question on norms and attitudes that are uh, also a big part of the challenge in educating girls? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. In terms of uh, gender norms, uh, like uh, at the beginning, uh, we had uh, many issues in terms like uh, 
in terms of gender norms and wrong trade and practicing of wrong traditional uh, wrong traditional practices uh, in the community like at the beginning uh, parents or the families are not allowing girls to continue their education which is the basic on fundamental rights for every uh, human being uh, but later on, uh, we worked through, uh, through different projects. Uh, we worked within the community to make them aware about what is, what will be, what is the, uh, the rights of education when your child will be get educated and what will be her future. Her future. Uh, like uh, we, have, we, we make them able to understand in terms of Islamic perspective. So we use uh, different uh, community dialogues within the community at uh, involving uh, mullahs to, to let them uh, to, to talk about the gender norms or the rights that the women or the girls have in terms of uh, getting education. And later on, uh, we uh, we witnessed or we uh, we saw a positive change uh, in many um, uh, in many provinces. Like in Pakhtia, I remember uh, at the beginning uh, we were we implemented one of our projects. But at the beginning, uh, uh, most of the families did not allow any um, female to continue their education or to be part of the discussions. But uh, after that. They, uh, they just not allow their daughters. They, they did advocate for the other people as well to, to let their daughters to, uh, to, be, part, to, to be part of uh, this that discussions, to, be, to continue their education, uh, to, to be as a, uh, a role model for others. So, but for the time being, we are facing challenges because we have to start from the beginning to make the people or the community, because uh, now the situation has changed, uh, we are not aware about the about the about uh, about what will be the uh, what will be the, uh, the the new policy which will be introduced by the Taliban. So based on that, we have to work with the community to build that trust to to let their daughters to continue their education. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dima, and, and really thank you to everybody. Unfortunately, uh, we've reached the end of our time for this uh, program today, uh, but it's been rich. Uh, it has informed us uh, tremendously. Uh, it has demonstrated just how complex uh, these issues are, uh, but also, and most importantly, why education of women and girls must be a priority. Uh, and why we need to do everything that we can uh, in ways that have been discussed today and, and certainly in other ways that we haven't even been able to touch on uh, to be able to ensure uh, that this reality comes true, uh, even under the current terrible situation in Afghanistan. Um, I wanna mention that tomorrow uh, we will have another virtual program uh, this one with the United States Special Envoy uh, for Afghan Women and Girls and Human Rights, Irina Amiri. She was in Norway for the discussions that took place with Afghan civil society leaders, uh, Taliban uh, representatives, uh, as well as others in the international community. Uh, so she will be able to brief on that tomorrow. Uh, and for those who are interested, uh, I hope that you will tune in for her uh, and Maria Longhi from USAID, who uh, was with her um, for that session. Uh, I want to thank uh, very much uh, from all of us, uh, Paul Washa, Shabana, Pashtana, Dima, and Maria for your words today, but even more for the extraordinary work that you continue to do uh, for the commitment that you manifest and for calling all of us uh, to stay engaged and to stay engaged in ways uh, that are effective uh, and really make a difference. Uh, so thank you for that. And uh, I trust that all of our uh, viewers today who are with us uh, will tune in tomorrow.